I started in 2008 with a series of tweets. And what did the tweets say? Um, they were sort of nonsensical, half-sensical um, tweets saying that, or you know, alleging that he had written um, my song The Fear, which had come out a couple of months previous mm. to that. And how did he describe himself? How did he, what was his handle? He, well, on, on Twitter, it, you know, his hand, it was at Lily Allen is R.I.P., but also his name, Alex Gray. Y yes. Or, or no, actually, because I think at the time, um, you know, it was the Lily Allen is R.I.P. that would have stood out yeah, to me. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that I saw his name at that point. It was only when I went back to look at them that the name jumped out at me. So when the, you had this kind of avalanche of tweets, what did you what did you do? What did you think? Did you think these are abusive tweets? And nothing else will happen. Um, it's a long time ago, so I can't I can't hand on heart say exactly what, I, what made me feel. But I, I I I noticed them, you know, and I and I do get a barrage of abuse on Twitter. So it must have been significant enough for mm. me to have acknowledged them and sort of stored them in my brain somewhere. Um, because, you know, then subsequently to that, when I started getting letters, or et cetera, mm. et cetera, it was the content of those letters that made me realise it was the same person. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that, that's... So, when did the letters start? What happened? And where did they come to? <clears throat> well, I had a, ha a flat in Queen's Park, in North West London, and my assistant at the time was at home um, doing something, and I think I was away on business. Um, she called and said that somebody had rung the doorbell. Um, she'd gone to get the door, door and they'd said, uh, my name's Alex, I'm a friend of Lily's. Is she in? At uh, which point Vicky said, no, she's not. She said that he seemed quite strange. Um, and then he grabbed a pile of mail from inside the door and ran off. Um, and she then called me and we called the police. And what was the police response? Um... I think it was just, you know, a report. It wasn't anything... Did they come and see you? No, not at that point. Did you ask them to come and see you? No, I don't think so. I but think you'd it reported it? And that was, what, seven years, seven, six, seven years ago? That was in 2000, and early in 2009. So I think, uh, you know, at that point, when, you know, when he had come down to London, rang the doorbell and stole in the post, it didn't occur to me that it was the same person as the no. tweets at that point. So it wasn't, I didn't feel, I didn't connect the two. And you didn't feel necessarily totally threatened? No. It was just, you know, a guy ringing the doorbell and stealing some post. But after that first contact with the police, then what happened? Then a few weeks later, letters started turning up. And the content of these letters reiterated what was said in the tweets about having written the song. He also touched on um, his uh, disappointment with the social um, system here in the UK. And, and it sort of was about mental hospitals mm -hmm. and um, you know his mistreatment by doctors that sort of linked in with me um, have being, you know, contributing to that in some way, mm -hmm. there being some conspiracy. And they were also written in a spiral um, so obviously alarm bells started ringing at that point. I knew that it was the same person as mm -hmm. the tweets and probably the same person that had turned up at my flat and stolen the letters and that's how he had my full address and postcode mm -hmm. in order to start sending the letters himself. Um, I believe he found my house at that point because there were large amounts of paparazzi mm -hmm. camped out on my doorstep. And when these letters started to arrive, then did you contact the police again? Yes. And what happened? Um, I think they came over and they took a statement and took the letters. And then did you have any other contact with them? No. So they didn't come back and say they'd investigated? No. And what did they say about your well-being? I think they just said, you know, if you see anything else suspicious, please let us know. Call 999. Did they give you a named officer to talk to? Um, I believe there was somebody, <clears throat> they were, there, were, there were several police officers that were involved with this, um, or points of contact that we were given throughout the years. There wasn't any one person mm. to talk to about it. 
so early in 2009, I, I played a concert at Coco, which is a relatively small venue in, um, in Camden. And I was on stage singing. And during the concert, I saw a, you know, often people hold banners up or, you know, messages for me to read out. Um, and I saw this banner that said, I wrote the fear where's my money, et cetera, et cetera. And I immediately knew that it was him, you know. And in that, the room. That, yeah, and that was quite terrifying because, well, not only because he was there, I didn't know if he had a weapon on him and that he was about to do something. Um, also, I was the only person in the building that knew who he was. And that was a really isolating moment for me, you know, knowing that he knew that I knew, but nobody else knew. Um, so I, on I, performing. I got on I got on you know got on with the song finished the song and then I ran to the side of stage where my assistant who had been there yeah. when the um, letters arrived was on the side of the stage and I said I think that's him it's him going you go and get the security and get them to call the police at which point they did and when the police came what happened they didn't talk to me they um, they came over the next day to my flat and I mean, you know, they didn't do anything. <laughs> I can't tell you what they did or said. They just sort of, you know, said that, they, that they'd made a record of it. And um, I believe that they that they found him. Or maybe maybe they arrested him. This is the thing. They never tell you what it is that they're But that you they're gave doing. them his name. No, I didn't give them his name. I said, you know, this is the guy that sent me the letters that mm -hmm. you have in your possession. Um, and they, I believe they... I don't, I don't know what they did, because they haven't told me. And did they ever give you anything to support you? Um, they did. They came and installed a panic alarm at my flat. And you never had cause to use that at that time? No. So what did they do with the panic alarm then? They came back and took it after six months, I think. And did you, you didn't object to that? I didn't really think there was much point in my objections. I didn't. I knew. I, I knew what the answer would be, which would, was, you know, it's been six months. There hasn't been any contact. We're going to take the alarms away now. At the time when he um, would go to your manager's office and he would go to your sister's shop, did anyone think of taking a snap of him? Well, <clears throat> the thing is, is I w was being pursued by the press a lot at that point in mm. time. Um, and I, you know, I suppose I could have sent an email out to everybody saying, I'm being pursued by this man, can everybody keep an eye out for him? Even though I had no idea what he looked like or a photo to tell everyone about. Um, but, you know, as a result of that, it would have ended up in the press yeah. and become a story um, and a dramatic, you know, hysterical story, which I didn't, I didn't want. So this, we're still only at 2009. Um, and how did things start to change for you inside? How did you start to feel different? Um, I, I didn't feel particularly scared at that point. You know, it was letters. I, he turned up at the, at the venue during my, my concert, but I sort of believed that the police had it in hand, you know, mm. and maybe that was naive of me, or maybe they did. Um, the thing is, is that I just haven't really had a dialogue with them and they haven't told me what their investigations yeah. were, whether they were pursuing him and investigating him. And I, you know, I think I'd probably just felt secure in the knowledge that I was collating all of this evidence and, and passing it on to them. I felt like I was doing Being what I was meant to be doing, you know, which is keeping a record and, um, and handing it over to the authorities. So this is in 2009, he's pretty active. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Um, uh, well, he he would sort of dip in and out of you know. Was he contact. still tweeting? I can't say to you whether mm. he was or he wasn't because you know as time went on, my Twitter following was was growing, and so I wasn't always keeping mm. an eye on every single tweet that was coming in. Um, it um, it would seem that he was in and out of institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, he. You know, when he was out and yeah. he would pursue me, when he was in, he wouldn't. But you only found out that he was in institutions much, much later. Yes. Did you ever think of leaving Twitter? 
Yeah, and I did. I don't know if that was really necessarily related to this, but I have you know, mm-hmm. spent long periods of time where I haven't tweeted. Yeah. I want to come on now. Um, After tw- uh, 2009, what kind of contact did you have with the police? Um, obviously, every time that there was a report made, there was contact with either me or someone that was working with me. Um, and uh, we did receive a phone call at some point from the police saying that uh, the man that had been stalking or the man that had you know was a suspect in the, you know sending me these malicious letters and turning up at concerts was active again i didn't know what that meant um and when i sort of pressed them for it they said that there had been an incident in scotland in glasgow uh where you had named he named you they didn't even say that they just said that he he was active what i had what i what i kind of the conclusion that i came to was that he'd been involved in some sort of altercation mm. and the police had been involved and um, but they had lost uh, you know they, they didn't know about his whereabouts so they called me to basically warn me and say be wary then after that you played the Hogmanay in 2014 in yep. Edinburgh and you knew that he could be in Scotland because he you knew at that point, I think, that he came from Perth. I knew that he was, yeah, that he resided somewhere in Scotland. So um, I had a, a concert in, yeah, in Edinburgh in, on New Year's Eve in 2014. Um, and, you know, we, we stepped up my security as a result of that. But you were determined to play? Yes. How Was it just very important for your own well-being that you played? Um... I think, you know, I'm quite a determined person and when I come up against things, I tend to sort of push through. And I wasn't, you know, it was a, an amazing opportunity and something that I really wanted to do. And I wasn't going to let this, the fear of, of something that may happen stop getting in the way of me doing that. And I still won't. What did your family think? Of me doing that concert? Yeah, I don't even think I discussed it with them. The thing is, is that <clears throat> the fear only comes from, uh, you know, all of these incidents added up together. And the only person that really has a knowledge of that is me. Yeah. So I, I wasn't really, I didn't really have a dialogue with anyone about it because as isolated incidents, it doesn't really sound that scary. You know, I received one letter or the police called me and said that somebody that, was pursuing me a few years ago is active you know it doesn't it's not it's not really it's only it's only really me that is aware of 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 it all if that makes any sense yes but cumulatively although it was sporadic cumulatively what kind of toll do you think it took on you it was just very surreal you know, and I think that I never really, even after he broke in, I never really knew how real the threat was. Um, and what this kind of attention does is just leaves you with lots of questions. And without the dial, you know, without a dialogue with the police, um, it just leaves you with more questions because you're sort of sat there and thinking, how real is this threat? What is? Do I need to, you know, protect my children more? Is Am I, is this just all in my head? Am I being overly dramatic? Uh, and, um, yeah. Did you ask for a photograph? I did. When? I um, believe it was in 2012. And what did they say to you? They said no at first. And we pushed them for a photograph and they came over and they showed us the photograph and then took it away. Well, in 2000, I probably once the police called and said this person is active, it was then when I um, had all of this security installed on my flat. So what did your flat look like? It, was <coughs> it had, you know, on the front, on the, you know, the street front of the house, it had, you know, grills that come down um, at a touch of a button, um, like you would see on the outside of a shop, you know. Um, there are grills on all of the inside windows at the back. Uh, alarms, sensor alarms on all of the doors. Um, and I, 
uh, that night of the break-in, I had burnt my supper. And so I had left the back door open because the children were there. I didn't want the fire alarm to go off. It was my oversight that I didn't lock the door. I only closed it. Um, so taking all of that into account, to me it was just too much of a coincidence mm -hmm. that the one night I have left this door open, somebody had managed to get into my bedroom. What did you think was happening? Well, I think at that point I started to think maybe it's the same guy mm. that's been sending me these letters and... Hanging about. Yeah, and it made me think that he had been watching me through my garden window in the build-up to this event, believing that I would be on my own, um, because I had been mm -hmm. up until that night. It was the first night that my friend had stayed over. Um, so he gets into the room, well first of all I'm lying in bed and I can see the door handle um, moving and you know then he steams in and starts screaming and shouting where's my dad, where's my dad, what have you done with my dad you bitch um, at which point I just, I was in shock um, I didn't know who this person was I, I said to him, what, what are you doing here? Um, I was concerned for him because I could see that he was really agitated and upset. Um, and, um, but it, it was very focused on me. It was like and he was very close to you. Yeah. And as close as we are. <clears throat> as close as we are, yeah. And I, and I recoiled. I recoiled back into my bed, at which point he ripped the duvet off. And I jumped out of bed at that point and ran around to the other side of the room. And um, he, he kept sort of shouting at me, but he was very focused on me. It was really confusing because it was, it was loud and it was aggressive and there was lots of sort of gesticulating going on. And he had something under his jumper. You know, there was something long and there was just something there, you know. And I... I Did you learn later what that was? No, I didn't. I mean, I had my suspicions as to what it was. I think it was a knife. Um, and why do you think that now? After I gave evidence, um, I was taken into a room and I was told by the CPS that um, in his interview, he said that he was going to put a knife through my face. And in that interview, which part of which was played in court, what did the police then say to him? We're going to end the interview there. We're going to end the interview there. I started saying to my friend, I don't know who this person is. He wouldn't communicate with my friend. He would only communicate with me. Um, and so my friend was saying, who is this? And I said, I have no idea who this is. And he would then started trying to convince my friend that I was lying. So he would say, she knows exactly who I am, she's lying to you, she's lying to both of us. Uh, so then not only, you know, I'm trying to, in the forefront of my mind, you know, I can see the, the door to my bedrooms, the, my children's bedroom across the hall. So um, I'm just sort of focused on that really. Um, but it, equally, you know, I wanted my friend to get him out, but he was, becoming convinced that this person did know me. And so then I had to run over to my friend and say, look, I promise you, I don't know who this person yeah. is. My children are in danger. Can you get him out? At that time, yes. Um, it was just a very odd encounter and it just didn't make any sense in my head. And I, and I couldn't, you know, it was... What was he shouting? He was shouting, where's my dad, where's my dad? You know, he was very convinced that, that, me, that myself and him had, an, had a relationship, you know, which was baffling to me because I obviously didn't know who this man was, but he was so, so convincing with it that, you know, that's why my friend, you know, thought that we did know mm. each other because he was very focused and the way that he was talking to me was, you know, like we had this pre-existing relationship. Mm. And... Um, you know, it, my friend managed to get him out of the house and then I 
um, you know, called the police. Well, I went to check on my children and called the police. Um, and I actually think that the police at that point thought that I knew him. Why? Just because they believed him rather than you? I think they thought that I was trying to conceal something. Um, so what was from it? From my friend. Right. Um, and, you know, they didn't call for any fingerprints people to come over or anything. Um, they, they literally said, if you see anything suspicious, call 999. So, hang on, this man is in your bedroom, you think he might be concealing a weapon and he's screaming at you. Mm -hmm. And when you tell the police this... They said that they thought it might be somebody that had had too much to drink and stumbled into the wrong house. Anyway, I googled his name and my name together and up came the tweets from 2008. So you, did you call the police again then? Yes, I called the police the next morning and I said, look, I would really like it if somebody came over and took some fingerprints because I've got these messages from this person that's mm -hmm. been harassing mm -hmm. me for the past eight years. Mm -hmm. You'll be aware about, mm -hmm. of him because of all the letters that I've sent you. <coughs> um, can you please come over and, and just check it out, even if it's just to eliminate him mm -hmm. from your investigation? Did they come and fingerprint? They did. They came over the next morning three police officers, and um, they didn't immediately come and fingerprint. They sat down and they talked to me for a little bit, and it then became apparent that my handbag had gone missing because I was looking for my car keys. And at that point, I could literally feel a sigh of relief within the room from the police because it became a burglary investigation. I called my husband and I said, can you take the kids because I don't really want them to be here. And he took the kids and I called my, uh, you know, close protection security person that I usually use for high profile yeah. events or festivals or whatever. And, I, and he lives in Paris. And I said, you know, I don't feel safe. Can you come over and stay with me? And he did. He came and stayed with me for 15 days until he was arrested. I don't think I really left the house that much. I think I, I just felt very, very isolated because I couldn't really explain this situation to anybody. Properly. Did you trust, because you didn't trust anyone not to talk to the press? Yes, that specifically. Um, um, they, I think they, they sort of, there was a bit of emailing going on. I think that, you know, I'd, because I'd said to them I'd, that I'd received these Instagram messages, they sort of said, you know, can you send us some screenshots? And so I did that. And you told them, of course, about all the letters again that they had. Yes. And where were those letters? There was no response. I mean, they didn't... I, w I would mention the letters and they would sort of... I just assumed that they would be finding the... You know, yeah. adding them to their yeah. investigation. It turned out that they didn't and that the letters were destroyed, at, what, at which point, I don't know. Did they not have a statutory duty to keep the letters? <laughs> Apparently it's seven years that you're meant to keep. It transpires that on the 9th of October, um, he had sent an email to his mother saying that he was in London, had come into some money, probably from my handbag, um, and that he was determined to murder a celebrity police didn't tell me that and I was living in the same flat on my own albeit with a security guard um, <clears throat> then on the 11th I think uh, I was DJing at an event and I came home at about one o'clock in the morning to find the handbag that had been stolen on the bonnet of my car burnt out um, and my passport and um, driving license and credit cards cut in half and you know just a, f a fire had been started in this handbag and it had been placed on the bonnet of my car on the drive outside my house um, at which point I called the police and the police came over 
and I think that th it was the next day um, that they installed CCTV on the outside of my house. And then a day after that, he was arrested. So they found him in London? I believe so, although I can't confirm that because I'm not aware of what their investigation. And what did you think when he was arrested? Did it bring you any relief? Yeah, of course. I was, I thought, he's, I can go out again, you know? I can see my kids. As long as he was in custody. I was confident, but I sort of said, you know, I assumed that they would call me into the police station and that there would be a line-up. They'd ask me to identify him. They didn't. So they just said he's going to appear in court tomorrow at his bail hearing. And, um, you know, I knew that the outcome of that bail hearing, if, in, if it was the right person, you know, might be that he's out on bail. So I wanted to be there for that bail hearing in, on the off chance that he was released on bail. And... Um, you know, because I didn't quite trust the system to call me and notify mm -hmm. me if he was released. So I wanted to make sure for myself that A, it was the right person, which they hadn't asked me to identify, um, and B, that he wasn't going to be released straight away. And if he was, that I knew about it, and I knew about it mm -hmm. straight away. Um, so, yeah. But it I must have taken a lot for you to go to court, did it not? Yeah, I mean, I was very anxious and scared. And what happened in court? Um, he uh, was brought up um, from the cells and he came in. He immediately made con eye contact with me. He started um, shouting at me in the court. He said... Um, he, he was under the impression that, you know, still that I had done something wrong to him and that it was a, mm. unjust mm. that he was um, in custody. And, um, but, you know, he was clearly, clearly ill. Um, you know, he was, there were lots of sort of paranoid rantings mm -hmm. going on. Um, did he threaten you? He did. When the judge said, why should I grant you bail today? He said, because the world would be a better place without her. And that's what I'm here to do. So you knew after that that he certainly wasn't going to get bail. But am I right in saying you actually went back to court? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that there was, I mean, there wasn't anyone from the police at court that morning. So, you know, even though I had witnessed this, nobody from the police had witnessed this and was writing it down in order to, you know, notify the CPS that he was continually threatening me. <laughs> when it came to, you know, the trial, I would have thought that that kind of information would have been helpful. Although maybe not in a burglary. Case. But he was done for burglary, but he was also done for harassment. How did that come yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the charges were never really properly explained to me. I mean, and um, there was a charge of burglary and a charge of harassment. But um, no stalking charge? No stalking charge. And... Um, you know, which is why I kept asking the police what they would, where were these letters and were they adding them to the indictment because um, as far as I was concerned that, that built our case for stalking. Yeah. But it didn't really seem like they were really interested in, in making a stalking case. I kept going back to court because there was nobody else. I kind of felt like every time I went to court, it provoked something in him that alerted the judge to how serious this thing was, right. because I didn't really feel like the police or the CPS were taking that seriously. So I kept wanting to be there so that the judge or whoever was dealing with him could see what his feelings towards me were and, and, and deal with it appropriately. And there was always a position where you could see each other. You couldn't be behind a curtain. Well, I, I was behind a curtain when I gave evidence. You know, the police weren't aware that I was going to all of these court sessions. Why, why not? Well, they didn't tell me about them. I, had to, you know, I found out about them myself.
I think it's you know it's had a really severe effect on on my trust issues with people you know and I I think when when things aren't sort of verified or validated by the authorities you're you sort of start to believe there's a bit of a conspiracy you know and and, and I don't I don't believe that there is a conspiracy but when you haven't got somebody to talk to about it or to validate mm -hmm. your fears then you're only left with time in which to make stuff up you know so it's sort of <coughs> um, very isolating you know and also not just that but when you're you know if you do want to talk to your friends and family about it there's not I mean what, what can you say because you're not really being, being given a definition to what's happened by the police it's not really the sort of thing that you just want to keep repeating over and over again you know I don't want to sit there and talk to my uncle about well it started with a tweet mm. in 2008 you know it's not it's not something that you want to go over and over again. But if no, I couldn't really hand on heart say I'm being stalked and I've been harassed for the past eight years. It's okay. They're going to send yeah. him down because that's not what anyone was telling me. And I and I ha I did have to take it upon myself in order to get the stalking charge added. I don't really have a dialogue with my friends at this point. <coughs> it has been incredibly isolating and um, I've, I kind of, every time that I've tried to talk about it to anybody, I've always sort of stopped myself because it, I've, I've felt like I'm being hysterical in some way. Um, and, you know, so I have withdrawn from my social life mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, th I think probably all my friends don't... Oh, I don't know, I just, I, there's not really a dialogue there any, anymore. I mean, it, it's been, it has been really hard and, and, and it's not, I'm not alone in this, you know. I, in the last, since Sunday, since the piece came out in The Observer, I have been inundated with women and men uh, saying exactly mm -hmm. the same thing, that they felt exactly the same way. They felt alone, they felt isolated, they felt like they couldn't really put a definition on what it is that had happened to them because that, hadn't been given to them by the authorities and um, and um, yeah it, it, I mean you start to think that you're going a bit mad after a mm. while I'm, I'm quite a tenacious person and I believe from the minute that he left that there was more to this than met the eye and um, you know I'm fiercely protective of my my family and my children and so I took it upon myself to hire a lawyer and to press for the charges that I thought were appropriate there are not many people in this country that have the resources to move house, take on a security guard, um, <clears throat> and 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 a, and a legal team in order to you know push the CPS and and the police. I feel very thankful that I do have those resources, but it makes me very very worried about other women and indeed men in this situation. I I'm not in the slightest bit angry with Alex Gray and. Um, I could see from the minute that he came into my bedroom that he was ill and that he needed help. I wanted to help him, you know. I felt immediately like um, something's really wrong with this guy. And, um, and I feel like, you know, he's, he's been let down. I've been let down. And how many other people are being let down? His mother has talked about his mental condition. Um, yes, it's, it, I think the Mirror have done an interview today with um, his mum, who's currently residing in Spain. Um, but she says that she's, you know, tried to alert the authorities about Alex's condition, which is, um, she says, is, is schizophrenia for mm. a good twenty years since he was in school, and that, um, and that she's she's been, uh, it's been like talk, speaking to a brick wall for her as well. But you know he's going to be sentenced now, and that must bring some relief. Yes, it does bring me some relief if he is um, sentenced and, and dealt with as a, as a mentally ill person. Because if he's not, I'm not safe, and my children aren't safe. And, um, and, and he deserves to have, live a happy life, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's not his fault that he's ill. And he shouldn't have to spend the rest of his life behind bars because he's probably living some sort of hell in his own mind. Um, 
and um, I just want him to get the help that he needs. Mm. I just I just need to start building the bridges with my friends and family again and um, and start talking about my experiences um, and and to go out and start socializing more. I got a response from them yesterday. Should I read it to you? Yeah. It says. Dear Mrs. Cooper, I have left you a voicemail to call me at your convenience, please. As you know, there have been press reports suggesting you were dissatisfied with the response you received. Further, due to the high profile of this matter, I fear other victims of similar crimes may have read the story and now may not have the confidence in us to report such matters. As such, it is really important that I can understand what, if anything, went wrong during the investigation. I was saddened to hear of this report, so I would like to hear your views on what we could do better. What do you think of that email? I think it's victim shaming and victim blaming. Um, the stalking started on social media. Do you think there's something about social media that encourages people to think there's a false connection between people? Um. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's, it, I don't think that you can be general about it because everybody uses it in different ways, you know. And there are some people, especially, you know, pe well known people that kind of forge that false relationship with their fans. That, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you're not of sound mind and you haven't got, you know, the correct support system in mm -hmm. place, that you may well believe that there is a connection that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really that type of well-known person, you know, I've, I'm, I'm quite sort of matter-of-fact and I don't, um, I don't pander to that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But there are some people that do, mm. but you, you know, it's, it's freedom of speech, so. Mm. 